Well, I am the stand-in tonight, and uh, it is my great good fortune over the past few months to have um, interviewed a lovely lady, a 90-year-young lady, in fact, who came over to this country in 1946 as a British war bride. Beryl met and married Thomas Rettinger while they were both serving in the military in England. Tom was an 8th Air Force man with the 52nd Fighter Control Squadron, and Beryl was a member of the Women's Auxiliary Air Force, the RAF. We heard a little bit about that earlier from Robin, too. Well, I am a stand-in tonight. She couldn't be here, unfortunately. So she asked me, because I've been doing some interviewing with her in the last few months, if I would just tell a little bit about what she did during the Battle of Britain, where she was, and just give you a little flavor of what life was like in the early years of the war for Britain to begin with in 1939. Well, as we know, uh, Britain found itself again on September 3rd, 1939, in yet another world war, one that they didn't really want to be in. At that time, Beryl Rettinger was 17 years old, and the government had suggested, highly, that families start to move out and away from England, and Beryl and her family lived in Wimbledon, which is quite close to the heart of England. So they did. Beryl and her mother and their nanny and Beryl's sister, sisters, moved a little bit north to get away from the impending war that they believed was coming to their uh, country. Beryl's father was able to stay in their home in, in Wimbledon because he had a job where he traveled around the country. However, after being away from their home for a few months, by the spring and early summer of 1940, and we talked about the phony war, was kind of complacent and families started to move back to their homes in London, and that's exactly what Beryl's family did. Well, consequently, within two, three months, the Battle of Britain ensued, and they were literally in the middle of it. However, during the time that Beryl and her family were gone, Beryl's family, or father, built a bomb shelter literally in the central hallway of their home, their two-story home. And she said night after night after night, the mattresses came up because that's where the entire family slept every night for months on end. Beryl recalls her mother standing in the window during a particular attack and pulling back the, the blackout curtain and watching afar as she could see the blazes and the bombings. And Beryl said she will never forget that, even as a, as a just a teenager, her mother watching the battle from her home. Fortunately, the whole, uh, family's home was not damaged. And by 1941, Beryl turned 18. And all British young women were required to register for service. And that's exactly what she did in the summer of 1941. One year later, the summer of 1942, she was in active duty. And at the age of 19, she became a member of the Women's Auxiliary Air Force, which is actually part of, uh, she came from World War I and part of the RAF. And Beryl has written just um, a few comments here that I just want to give you a flavor because she really um, tells you what it was like her as a 19-year-old woman uh, in, in the RAF, essentially. And this is what Beryl has to say. She says, we traveled by lorries to train stations to our destination camps to be inducted into the WAPs. We were given uniforms, the great coats, shoes. Um, uncomfortable, though, because I got blisters from doing our foot training and marching. We also got rain capes, uniforms, caps, shirts, ties, all other necessities, and a kit bag to carry it all in over the shoulder. We spent about three weeks learning all this, plus how to salute, make bets the military way, and eventually we were weeded out, and we took tests, and again sent to various camps for more detailed training. I was sent to Cranwell, again, Robin mentioned that too, 
which was the top training for uh, fighter pilot pilots in World War II. There, she learned RDF, Radio Direction Finding. She stayed there for several months learning this. She lived in a barracks hut, marched everywhere, cookhouse three times a day, had to line up in the parade ground, marched to all classes, gas drills, bomb drills, was a nervous wreck trying to learn all about the signal sent by her radio sets and so forth. Also had to learn the Morse code and how to use the oldest land. It was a hard course for girls not used to this type of knowledge. Some RAF instructors were kind and considerate. Others resented us learning to do a man's job, and they were not so kind to us. What they didn't understand is we were learning to do this job to relieve the men for other duties overseas. I was sent to several different camps before ending up at Manston, which is in the southeast of London, very, very near the channel. Here I was issued my battle dress dress for the duties of the RDF tower and also a bike to use for transportation. We had to sign in and out of the guard room. The buildup was everywhere with Allied forces preparing for the invasion, which of course was defeated. Lots of activities, lots of restrictions, very few cars on the road, mostly military, convoys and so on. Service personnel did a lot of hitchhiking to get places. All public transportation curtailed. When we went on night duty, we had to go to the cookhouse and collect our rations for the night. Just two of us on duty at a time. We had no protection against invaders, no protection against parachutists, no protection against the buzz bombs or the doo bugs. They heard the dog bites overhead all the time. Farmers working in the fields with tractors caused interference with our radio signals. We often had to run over to the fields to get their attention, to stop them working, which was, of course, not very popular. Often lines were cut, and we had communication op controllers, and they were not pleased. We had to have RAF personnel out from Manston to replace. The lines were not very, very deep. So, that, those were Beryl's words. What exactly was an RDF person? And what was their job? Essentially, her job as an RDF, RDF person was to aid in the air sea rescue of pilots in distress over the English Channel. And how was that accomplished? Well, it was pretty much manual compared to our electronics today. And it was pretty basic, but it did get the job done. In order to locate and get a fix on a pilot in distress, they use pretty much a three-station system. Essentially, three small wooden buildings or huts. They were so small that she said they could hardly, the two of them, move around in this little hut. They were set out away from the base proper and the ideal location for these three little huts in this unit was in the middle of a farmer's field, as we heard from her notation. Each DF or direct directing finding station had an antenna out of the room, which had to be rotated, of course, to hone in on these uh, direction findings. <coughs> Inside the station, the antenna pole was controlled essentially by a steering wheel. And Beryl said inside the steering wheel mechanism was a disc, which she would push as she's turning the steering wheel to pick up the voices of the RAF pilots that were in distress. And she said once she heard the voice, it had to be the lower pitch voice. It couldn't be the high, louder pitch. It had to be the lower pitch. And then she knew she had a fix. As soon as she did get this coordinate, it was coordinate. It was phoned in immediately to the base aerodrome control tower. Then it was immediately handed over to the flying group, where they would put the strike. Once they heard from all three little huts, they had their coordinate. Wherever the three strings from the three huts intercepted was exactly where air-sea rescue would be sent because that was the point. 
that they needed to work. Beryl recalled with sadness and tears when she remembered the voices of some of these distressed pilots. She said there was nothing they could do, just listen, to try to get the coordinate, and pass on the information as soon as they possibly could to save the flight boy's life. She also remembered a call she got once from the main tower to con congratulate her on a rescue that was made from her coordinate alone. Usually they would have to have the three coordinates to pinpoint the exact location of the pilot. However, the other two huts could not get the voice. So they went with her coordinate, and sure enough, they were able to rescue the pilot. That's something she's very proud of. And she has much to be proud of. Her courage in serving her country during this time in England, the early days of World War II, and her willingness to tell us the story is very, very wonderful. So that we can all remember why exactly we do have the peace and the freedom that we have today because of people like Bill. Thank you. Thank you. RFD, when you said you, she would listen for the voice of the pilot, what do you mean? Yes, the radio direction finder, finder they would uh, tune in and turn the antenna until they actually heard the voice on that frequency that they were tuned into. They would actually hear the voices of the pilots. Um, and try to garner as much information from what the pilot was saying. They couldn't talk to the pilot, but they could hear what the pilot was saying and therefore be able to get his coordinate and, and send to rescue. Mary, on that line, were any of those recorded? Were any of those distress calls? Recorded? Not that I know of, but they took notes. They frantically took notes, and they were reviewed. Um, so they would write as fast as they could, but I don't think that they were recorded. Question here? 